Welcome, everybody. It's the Boardroom Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bass, and uh, my good friend, Devin Howard, joining us this morning. Good morning, Devin. Good morning, Scott. Why are we up so early? Good. Damn, this is brutal. <laughs> this is not early for me, but um, <laughs> as a guy who has a young toddler, how old is your young son now? Uh, he's just cracked 15, uh, 15 months. Okay. So he's on his way to toddlerhood, right? Yeah, he's raging. He's, you know, we'll probably hear him in the background. Good. Well, I'm him right now. Um, so how's fatherhood for you, Devin? How's, how's, it, how's it fit? I love it. I think, um, you know, I got a late start. I, 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 might, I thought I missed the boat, and then I got lucky and found someone late in life, and one of those I wish I'd done it sooner, but I love every second of it. And I think being older has its advantages. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, you're not, um, never have I thought like I'm missing out on something. Yeah. Right. I'm totally 100% um, content and engaged whenever I'm with them. Yeah. I wish I could be with them more. You know, the worst is if you leave and, and I, you know, go to work or go somewhere and he's at the door crying and, yeah, it's his hand like that, like, come back to me. It's like the worst, the worst feeling. Yeah. Um, but we're loving every second, and there's one more coming in July. So wow. we're gearing up for round two. That's cool, man. That's a great thing. To have two yeah. of them is awesome. Yeah. So I, I know that um, at some point, my wife and I are were like, God, wouldn't it be great if you could just have like six? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it would be pretty cool like we just don't as a culture we just don't do it like that anymore because you know we're not you know sowing the fields with we're right not, we're not harvesting we don't need six kids <laughs> which is kind of selfish but anyway well you can you, know, you still have time just like me you know you, you can go you can adopt <laughs> okay fair enough i'll, I'll take send that you some link. i'll send you some links yeah do that i'll I'll take that into consideration. Um, I've got a silly question for you, but bear with me here. This is going to make you have to think a little bit. Your it's your wife and kids are gone. It's Sunday afternoon, evening. It's raining. It's stormy. It's dark, and you're going to put on the greatest film of all time. You're going to turn down the lights and you're going to crank up the volume. What's this film? Jeez, um, what is that film? Um, I don't know, man. I, I don't want to say some cheesy thing, um, like ET or something. Oh, okay. You just said it. <laughs> ET, duly noted. <laughs> For the record, you got it wrong. It's Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Elliot. <laughs> so, Devin, you were. You were just in Hawaii. We saw some stuff. I saw some stuff on Instagram of you surfing in Hawaii. Tell me a little bit about your Hawaii trip. Did you get, did you get some good waves? Um, we, we missed the best season in Hawaii, I think, in history. I think it was yeah. good for, what, about three months? And we showed up the day it was over. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but it, we were with, you know, with the family we had an opportunity to stay at a really beautiful house right on the beach, right in front of pipeline. It was just an incredible opportunity and didn't care that the wave sucked. It was blown out every day and, but there was no crowd and it was warm and I loved every second of it. So I had a blast, man. It was like shoulder head high North, you know, that whatever those Northwest winds were just beating it. And um, it was awesome. We had a good time. Yeah. Don't you think like any time you can not be in a wetsuit, especially at this latter stages in our life when the body's not moving as well, it, I swear just taking the wetsuit off, I felt 10 years younger just in the way I could move. Yeah, no, you're so absolutely that, right. Yeah. So, um, but Hawaii, I don't know, Hawaii is my favorite place to go. I, if I don't, I don't have regrets in life, but if, if I could have done something, one of them would have been to move to the North Shore when I was in my in my twenties. I contemplated it, thought about it, 
was in love with a girl. Oh, I don't want to go to the North Shore. Should have done it. I, I feel at home and uh, Sunset Beach, Haleiwa, those big facey waves. Yeah. What about you? Do you spend much time there? Yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't say much time. Um, I went there in 86. I went there in 88, 89. And I didn't go back. Uh, I did go to Kauai in like 92. And then, um, of course, as, as you know, <clears throat> working at Surfer Magazine, I, I went every year, every season from, I think, 99 or 2000 through 2007. I went every season for the North, you know, for the for the pro season. And, um, you know, I recently I, I do. I love Hawaii, too. I like it as a place to visit. I don't think I would want to live there. Um, but it's a wonderful place to visit. What yeah. what kind of boards did you ride when you were there? Um, I didn't. I would have loved. I would have loved to have brought a longboard. I always bring a longboard because there's all those days when it's like waist high and no one's out. But I just brought a what did I bring? A six eleven twin fin version of the mid, and um, I brought a seven four two plus one for when it was bigger. There were a couple of days at, at Lonnie's that were way, I mean, pretty, maybe they were not, maybe like double overhead, like pretty good size, but wild. Yeah. That board was killer. I was so stoked I brought that board. When you say wild, what do you mean? Like chunky and just sort of unorganized? Yeah, yeah like lumpy and peaky and you're out there and there's only three or four guys out in this yeah. crazy ocean and you're looking around going, shoot, am I in the spot? And uh, all right, yeah. here we go. You know, and it's like two or three lips and. Yeah. I love that kind of stuff. But yeah, I do too. The seven four was good for like uh, that double overhead zone, just that little extra foam. Draw the lines out, you know, the arcs aren't as tight, but you feel more stable. And that two plus one setup is just really reliable and that kind of stuff. Or one plus two, as Matt Bialis would tell me. <laughs> well, I'm actually uh, interested in the twin fin, right? The the, the twin round pin that um from channel islands which i have yet to uh i haven't had the you know been able to to have that board to try that board out but i want to because that's what i ride i i'm loving my mid-length my channel islands mid-length that you so graciously sent to me and but i'm and maybe it's my age but I love the squirt that the twin fin seems to give me. I love the little bit of extra speed and with the right fins, as you mentioned, I seem to have plenty of drive. So I'm a big fan. Tell me about your twin fin that you rode in Hawaii. Well, it's just, um, it's the same as that mid you have, but it just has a twin and, um, I, add, I added a 16th of an inch of rocker in the tail, which sounds like nothing, but you know, a 16th of an inch makes a huge difference when it's spread over like a 24 inch area in the tail. And it, I don't know, it just feels better in between the turns when you, you know, when you roll your ankles in those little setup check turns and that sort of thing, there's more confidence and there's another gear so like you'd said that that down the, off the bottom spring is nuts. I think the harder thing to get used to is that mid face turn. I feel like that the little side bites let you turn mid face with ease and confidence and there's nothing weird about it. Those I'm riding bigger keel fins. So when you're in that mid face turn and coming back down and arcing toward the white water, if you're not on your games, it feels a little I don't want to say tracky, but it just, I just don't have the confidence. I don't know how to totally yeah. articulate it, yeah. but the trade-off is the speed. So it's like, you got to ask yourself, do I want the speed or do I want to be able to do that just crazy turn mid face? And I, I'm leaning more nowadays toward the speed. I'll take the speed yeah. because when you have speed, you can kind of overcome any, any weird adjustments that you need to get used to. And I think with those twin fins, Maybe you can't ride as far forward. The two plus one has a wider sweet spot. Yeah, You can kind of screw up, I think, a yeah. lot more and recover without having to roll the windows up. Yeah. And that's the difference. So I'd, I'd love for you to try that. I think. I think yeah. 
I, I want to try it. I'm curious about your fins and I want to get back to that. But I think I, I do agree with you that for, you know, I'd rather have the speed. I do think that around three quarters of the way through the roundhouse cutback, you have to be exact in your feet positioning. And frankly, in the thickness of the board, it, 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 you have to carry the buried rail and it won't take much for that thing to pop up and you to be screwed. Whereas a two plus one gives you so much more um, room for, for screw up, you know? And, and for me, the twin fin, it's like, okay, go to the bottom and then go up to the top and do, keep doing that. Whereas the two plus one allows me to kind of, I can just kind of move the board around anywhere on the face with confidence, with yeah. the ability to go, yeah, you know what? I might not have the speed, but I know that there's a lot more versatility in where I do the turn. Yeah. And I think, I think the average guy likes that, just having that as an option. And, um, but I do think there's going to be an average guy who's like, you know, I'm not doing much <laughs> anyways. I'm just kind of pointing and shooting for nine o'clock. Just give me the speed. You yeah. Know? So it's good to have that breakdown. So it's like, where are you at? What do you want to do? You want those options to just break the line or go up the face in a different part of the wave easier. But if you're never going to do that, maybe just go with the twin and just go for afterburners. And, and then especially in like crowded regions of the world, when you're coming, I, I find that it's really helpful when you're, screaming down the line and you add that extra gear and that extra speed you, you see more people pull back like oh gosh yeah. that guy's gonna make it <laughs> yeah so you don't have to hoot and holler as much like hey come down <laughs> <laughs> well you know you mentioned something interesting which is the concept of the average guy and i think one of the problems with the average guy is that he doesn't realize that he's not really doing too much I told a guy in the water the other day, I go, you know, really all we're doing is bottom turns. And, and this was an average guy in his forties and I've surfed with him before. And believe me, that's all he's doing is a bottom turn and maybe a roller coaster at nine o'clock. Yeah. And, and he was like, you know, sort of taken aback, like, no, man, I do, you know, I surf like whoever, you know, Philippe Toledo. <laughs> and, and I think if more people realized, look, all you're really doing is a bottom turn and maybe a top turn. Um, I think they, they might broaden their horizons about what they could and should ride rather than sort of being on something that's maybe the board du jour, the contemporary shortboard design of the day, but just doesn't fit his average, you know, your average surfing. Right. Was, so he was kind of shattered when he, when he, <laughs> no, because I put it on myself. I said, I said, look, all I'm really doing, I didn't say all he's really doing, but I was hoping he would figure it out when I said, all I'm really doing is a bottom turn. So this 610 works great, you know, and he was, you know, whatever. <laughs> but tell me about your fins. So you mentioned that you ride keels because I've been riding those, those, um, those sort of tweener fins that NVS makes, which are the C drives, which have a keel base, but have that C cut out of the mid part of the fin. And then they go to a normal tipped sort of contemporary yeah. fin. And I love those fins. Uh, what, are, what, what are your thoughts on that? Have you ridden those fins? No, but I'd like to try them. Um, I'm still experimenting. I think, uh, I don't know. I always, we've said this before. I feel like you and I have similar approaches to surfing and we like to push on our fins and I, maybe it was the fin placement, but when I've had the more upright fins, let's just call them the MR style, you yeah, know, sure. fins. And I, I think it does come down to placement where the boxes are. I felt a little bit slidey. You know, yeah. I feel like I have to let off the gas pedal a little bit. And I don't like that feeling. I like probably my fins would lean in the spectrum of loose to stiff. I think I lean more on the stiffer side of things. Um, I think you do lean a little bit on the looser side just from discussions we've had, which is why, as you've mentioned before, fins are a really tricky conversation because it's like ice cream. I like chocolate. You might like strawberry. Who, what's, what's right or wrong? And with myself, I, I've found that the keels, I ride these, they're called the Al Merrick keels. And the... Brett Merrick made them for the fish beard, which came out a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's a flat inside foil. 
keel and they took one of Al's twin fins and just kind of tweaked it a little bit. And it's an insane fin. And I've had a few of my friends jump on it and we've compared uh, the upright fins to that. And they're like, man, the keels are better. I don't, I don't know why. I, I do think it's the placement. So I just made a board where I moved the fin box back not quite a half inch, but significantly and put yeah. it closer to the rail. Wow. I'm picking it up today. So I'll let you know how that goes. And I, and I want to spend time with the uprights because I think the downside to the keel is some of that mid face stuff. I think I'm losing some of the freedom. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't really feel I've like suffered. I'm loving the board, but I'm, I'm curious. Can I get a little more from, a to B, am I going to get a little bit more of zing? You know, that little just by removing all that width, I, I wonder. So, yeah, I mean, look, here's the interesting thing from my perspective is that, look, I'm I'm average middle aged guy and you've given me all the speed with this twin fin. Now I want to do something with it. And my sense is and again, fins are different and each fin and each board is different and it's extremely nuanced and it's not something we can generalize, but here we go. Um, I want something with all that speed that lets me surf a little bit more in an attack style, hopefully getting somewhere near 12 o'clock on my turns. Of course, they're going to be more like nine o'clock. And I sense that, and it could be in my head, but the keels kind of are more of a drawn out sort of roundhouse, like and, and I hate to, I always think of, of Dave Parmenter, you know, back in the 80s, he was the king of going out onto the shoulder and doing these beautiful figure eight roundhouses, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Of course, I'm just, I personally feel like when I have speed, I want to be able to take it vertically into the, into the lip. Sure. And uh, by the way, I know that Dave does too. I'm not trying to throw Dave under the bus. It's just, that's what comes to mind is that the keel is that wrapping figure eight roundhouse and, um, I, I want to take that speed somewhere else. Yeah. I've had long fish boards like from Josh Hall and I've written, I, I never had a skip fry long fish, but I've tried them and just the keel felt pretty, pretty sweet. But I heard you talk about going vertical. So are you a high, <laughs> perform, are you a high performance mid lengther? Is, oh <laughs> is that a taboo? Can we talk about that? Because <laughs> there's, I've seen like a Harrison Roach had a video recently where he was riding a twin fin mid length and trying to do airs. There's like Harley Ingleby, he'll like hit the lip. And so is there a proper way? Do we have traditional mid length, <laughs> traditional <laughs> mid length there's in high performance? Like what, what are we allowed to do? Uh, we're we allowed, barriers? Well, let me just say this. We're allowed to do whatever the hell feels good. <laughs> All right. It, I might not, it might not look good, but it felt good. Uh, yeah. Someone's going to be like, hey, just get back on a shortboard, Bassy. Get off that 610 and get, get back on your 6'2 and you can really hit the lip. You know what? If there wasn't 30 guys on 610s, I would. But uh, unfortunately, there's 30 guys I'm dealing with on 610s and 7'2s that are, oh, by the way, are just doing bottom turns. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was recently in mainland Mexico and I was on a 511 and I absolutely loved it. And of course, as you mentioned, there was no wetsuit. So you feel a lot freer and I have no problem on, you know, something under six feet. It's more about the, the outside issues. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the same with, um, if you, you, you've ever been lucky enough to go to the wave pool, that's the, 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 the biggest mind blower is that you don't have to hassle to catch the wave. So it's just like, that's in the very beginning. Yeah. In that place, you can ride a pretty small board. I, I've been lucky enough to go there twice. And I found that the longer rail was, was a hindrance. You know, it was, it was too much board. I have a theory that yeah. the greatest board for Kelly Slater's wave pool, and I'm serious about this, is a boogie board. <laughs> really well what are you doing you're just trying to get tuned true i mean there are moments when you're doing top turns but my experience on that wave and i've surfed it numerous times is that even if you are doing a turn in the back of my mind i'm going oh shit i better not miss the barrel section <laughs> you know like it's more about everything's kind of setting up for the tube which you know is coming like so mm -hmm. you know i'm i'm future tripping on the tube section and i recently saw mike stewart um, surfing yep. and 
it was it, that's where it became clear to me that you know what and maybe it's a pipo maybe it's a wooden pipo no drag and, and yeah. i would also suggest that maybe um there's probably some truth to an alaya being a really good board there because you can ride super high it's you're going to be racing faster than any board with fins on it so i'm kind of torn I, I i hate you know it maybe it's a little uh you know maybe i'm being a little bit uh i don't know out there but i think a boogie board so is a really good a, a pipe i would love to be on my belly in that barrel just flying super fast like you know because i mean we got to get down pretty small really small you know yeah. what i mean and it's kind of like okay yeah i got the vision but wouldn't you rather just be lying down like way back there going yeah i'm getting the vision yeah. and i th i think the boogie board or pipe is the perfect yeah. board for the in a eight I got as tight as I could in that barrel and I, I did come out, but my head was scratching the roof. You, you could see like the little, my head and there's like a little trail from my head. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. man, I can't get any smaller. So, so I take it, you would only lay down. You would never go like Paul Roach, Keith Sasaki, drop me. Cause no. then you'd be touching no. the roof. No, so to lay me, down that's, all the way. if you're going to stand up, just, I don't know. Yeah, no, it would be laid down. It, it would be laid down the whole way. Boogie board okay. style. Mike right. Stewart style. Mike Stewart inspired me. Look, Channel Islands, you obviously, uh, maybe I should have introduced this. And, well, I will in the beginning of this segment, but you work for Channel Islands in some sort of marketing position. I don't know the exact title, but tell me about Channel Islands. And um, they seem to be positioned really, in my from my perspective, and of course I work in the surfboard industry, it, it seems like, you know, they have world-class high performance boards obviously that's been their mainstay and just a, a month ago um brit merrick and the channel islands crew and by the way congratulations you guys won the stab in the dark with jack robinson and channel islands also tapping into the core market with mid lengths and twin fins and comfortable high performance boards for guys like me relaxed fit jeans so to speak um tell me about uh how you feel ci is positioned in the marketplace um, well, I think it's pretty, pretty good right now. I think you just sort of described a lot of it and it's, um, you know, if people have made comments like, oh, you know, they got into mid lengths and twin fins and Brit has been kind enough to point out that they've, they've been involved in that for a lot longer than maybe people give them credit and, you know, not, maybe not not saying oh the first to do this or that or whatever but the, you know he's been around since 69 so he's been through all of it um you know in the 80s and 90s they had some really cool models like al al started riding some boards there was um various sort of eggy mid-length shapes and you'll see him pop up on craigslist here and there and people go oh yeah you guys did make those boards but they're most known for the performance board because of the momentum generation the, the malloys the kellys all those people and that was, I think what was most interesting to Al Merrick was like that, always that progressive mindset that I think um, most performance shortboard builders have sort of been there. And, um, and I think as of late, there's that idea of build the best boards for the best surfers. That was always the key driver for Al. And I think that is the key driver for Brit. And Brit has been focused on building the best surfboards for all surfers you know i know that maybe that sounds like a cheesy thing but i'm just trying to simplify of like what's the idea so it's like hey if we're gonna do if there is a fish or a mid-length let's just not make it okay let's make it like the best version of it and if that is your mindset and anything you do whatever you're making whatever yeah. product you make I, I that's a great place to be and on a personal level that's been the attraction of being there that's why i've that's why I'm there. Yeah. I don't want to half-ass stuff. And it's like, when we get up every day, what's the best version of this thing? And going through and testing it with multiple people and, and doing 12 versions of it, which sounds insane, but it's like, you know, the, the even down to the less than a 16th of an inch. Yeah. We just need that little tweak and, oh, the, you know, you've got the plan shape that you got the rock or the rails. And it's like, oh my God, we, we, we screwed up the fins. The fins were the key to this thing. And yeah. Just go down that rabbit hole and that, that's so much fun. So I think position wise, it, they're in a good, 
we are in a good place also beyond the design point is just the manufacturing side. I know you've talked to Britt before and myself, but I'm really stoked on the domestic board building thing. You know, we were, and you guys have mentioned this before, but wherever you go to Channel Islands in the world, if you're in Costa Rica, you're in Australia, it's made there. So I like yeah. that idea that when you buy that board, that money that you've put into the local economy stays there and it cycles through there. Yeah. And we get just a tiny little piece of that, you know, so yeah. overall that money stays there. Yeah. So I feel good about being there. And cool. the stab in the dark thing was pretty cool. Like that, <clears throat> I, I know a lot of people don't have uh, stab premium, but if, if you do um, or you don't, maybe you should get it. I, I'm not a, you know, I'm not sh shilling for stab. I don't work for stab, but I, I like what stab's doing. You know, they're, People talk shit on them like, oh, they're going to charge the paywall. Fuck those guys. And you and I have both worked in media. We know how hard it is to make. You, you can't just, this isn't a hobby, you know, like that people aren't just going to go down and, hey, we're going to do make, we're going to film Jack Robinson for weeks, riding all these boards, doing all this stuff. And then we're just going to put it out for free. Yeah. It's not <laughs> going to happen. And if you love surfing and you want good content, I think those guys are doing a good job. I think that stab in the dark they just did was the best one they put together. Like the art direction, the editing, they built some drama. I think Jack himself was the best one they've had, like as a person, because he was brutally honest. Yeah. He kept people on their toes and it was like the boards you thought he was going to keep. Oh, like he's friends with those guys or he's getting boards from those guys. He, he cut them first round. I was like, whoa, yeah. okay. This guy's got some integrity. He's like, He's not bought off, you know? So I think it was a good yeah. stab in the dark. I agree. I, I enjoy all of them. And uh, you're right. Stab has an authoritative voice regarding uh, surfboard design and surfboards. And I think that other media outlets would be wise to kind of pick up on that because that's, as you and I know, I mean, you and I are both board geeks and boards are what drive our culture. I mean, that's at yeah. the end of the day, it's about the surfboard. Um, yeah. And the, the, the performance short board is a really difficult board to shape. Um, I would also argue that the traditional long board is one of the hardest ones. That's a, another conversation for another time, but those incremental things and, and Jack summed it up, you know, that he, he teed it up talking about, you know, a formula one board, which is what a performance short board is these high level CT surfers that, most mortals can't act. I mean, you can ride it like an okay surfer could ride one of these boards, but they can't really access <clears> the potential <throat> just because they don't have all the different things that go into it, athleticism, technique and all that. But the amount of time that's spent to refine it and the amount of disappointment yeah. to get there. I mean, to make that board that Jack one, it was this quick version of it, if you don't know this already, is Parker Coffin, who is, I would say, the best free surfer in the world right now, high performance wise. Maybe I'm a little biased. He's a friend. I like him, but he's yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. That's a, hey, I like it. That's a major. That's a that's a hot take right there. I love it. <laughs> but um, he's he's really passionate and and one of the cool things about Parker and I think it's rare in, in a high performance surfer he can really articulate what the board is doing and the guy comes in with a little notebook I've heard about this with crazy notes and then he brings in his laptop and he has a video queued up to what he's talking about he's like okay shows Brit brings it up he's like okay see the board right here this omen, it's catching just a little. And I'm I'm squinting my eyes, going, what is he talking about that it's catching? He's I mean, he's going Mach 20 and ripping, but yeah. that's how fine-tuned of a surfer he is. And Brit's just eating it up, going, Oh my gosh, like this guy is yeah. helping me as a shaper because the shaper, his job is to serve the surfer. That's what Al would say, and that's what Brit says is is, is to listen. And that's what kelly did with al that was like a real you know because kelly's just so into design and that was a real great relationship and now Britt has someone like parker and there are other people on the team but they went so deep on this board and what they really attacked 
on this particular board was they really went to town on the rocker. Yeah. And curb is everything. You talk to our good friend, Wayne Rich, he's all about the curve and the rocker. Yeah. And once you find that rocker, you can kind of carry it with you to different models. You go, all right, this is our starting point. I know I love this curve. I know when I get on it, it's familiar and it's going to go fast. Yeah. Then we start messing with the width, the tail and nose and all that. So right. um, the CI Pro project was pretty cool to watch. And then, you know, the toughest thing is to get other people to like the design and then just watching the whole process. Like it was a lot of fun. So if you haven't seen it, I said, check it out. You know, I spoke to Britt, I don't know, about a month ago. And I said, I asked him, I said, look, besides Parker, who would be the, the next really good guy on Stab in the Dark? Who would, which surfer should they choose, you know? And we hemmed and hawed for a little bit. I, of course, already had the answer in my head. And I, I'm going to throw this at you. And maybe I already have before, I forget. But I think Kelly Slater would be the, uh, an excellent choice for Stab in the Dark because we all know that guy can convey concepts and ideas back to the public. He's a great communicator. He's honest. He's sincere. Um, and, and he because he's involved with Firewire, he owns Firewire. It, yeah. it would be like, it would be a bold move. You know what I mean? It would be a really bold move for Kelly to go, yeah, I'll do it. You know, basically saying, you know, I know one of my boards isn't going to be in the equation, but let's do this. Anyway, your thoughts on that? I mean, that's a no brainer. I think they've kind of tried to do it. I don't know if you're aware, but they've tried to do the acid test with him. Oh, I didn't know. And that. during the pandemic, uh -huh. and I think half of it's filmed. So the kind really? of like half project, I don't know if I'm like blowing it here, but no, you're not blowing it. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody at Firewire pull the plug? But no, I think, you know, I don't want to be like, whatever. I'm not, I don't work at Stab. I think my understanding is it's just pandemic time's over. Kelly's chasing a world title. I got it. I think it's hard to pin the guy down. So yeah. it's like, how do they finish it? Right, right. But there's some great stuff you know we yeah. we he's riding one of our twin pins the mikey february twin pin with like a cool acid splash on it apparently ripping on it there, oh, no, i don't know if we'll ever see the footage it might just go away you know like right he's like in that contest mode but yeah he'd be great why i mean why not let's see it just i also think daniel thompson would be really good because he surfs so well and he's a shaper you know yeah. so he'd be able to and he's He's super critical. Like he, he would probably, yeah. It, it would be pretty, you know, vocal. I think they kind of. It seemed to me they teased the next surfer, which would be Chloe Blum, um, brother. Oh really? Chloe and Dino. I almost said Blumfield, which is Honolulu. Chloe and Dino. You think that's the next guy? I mean, they they teased him in this Jack one. I oh mean, yeah, he was, right. he was pretty entertaining. Yeah, he was on the Pang, the one that got kicked out like first yeah so i don't know hey hold on for a minute i'm gonna be right back i gotta go handle my dog real quick key, okay? key break <laughs> okay key. Key. <laughs> i'll be right back do it
Wow, is that a is that a lightning bolt on your chat? What is that? Okay, you don't know. Come on. Is, oh, is that a parish? What is yeah, that? Yeah, parish. Oh. All right. I just was like, wow, Chargers fan. You you see. You I am a Chargers them. fan. Chargers, Tom Parrish fan, all of those things. <laughs> um, let's let me ask you this. Re let's just finish. I want to finish up with the CI concepts. Um, surfboard design is cyclical, as you know. I mean, back in 1980, uh, 1980, I guess it was, or 1981, maybe, before the tri-fin, I was riding a twin fin pin, a round pin twin fin made by Gary McNabb at Nectar, and a lot of people were, a lot of the top surfers around North County, San Diego, John Glom and um, Doug Silva, and a lot of guys were riding this board. And here we are 40 years later riding this board. And so it's this cyclical thing, as you know, I mean, everything seems to come into fashion. So crystal ball time, what, what's the board du jour at this time next year? Like what's the next sort of thing that we're all fired up on at this time next year? Wow, that's a big one. Hmm. You talking like globally just, or as a, just kind of like the way that, you know, the, the twin fin round pin came back into our sphere here. And, you know, it, there was a time when, you know, that real thinned out rocker thing came about. And I don't know. Um, I don't I'll know, throw, one, I'll throw one at you. What about glass on fins? Glass on fins on, on a custom level, absolutely. I think they, they're the best, but I mean, I think you know the answer that <laughs> surfboard companies and surf shops don't want to see, they don't want to see those things. No. But um, I've got some glass on fins recently and I love them. I swear by them. Yeah. You can feel the difference. There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing in the way. It's just more um, integrated, integrated with the board mm -hmm. and Shortboard pros had them forever. A lot of that's because they're superstitious. They're the most superstitious people on the planet. <laughs> mm. um, but I think a lot of it was truly feel, you know, I think even right up to the end, Andy Irons and, you know, he was still just like, no, give me glass ons. And um, no, I don't think glass ons will be a thing. I think that, I think twin fin is going to continue to <clears throat> reign supreme. I, I don't think we've, we've, I don't think we've run through that trend yet. Hmm. So right. like for us at Channel Islands, we, we're having a great run with the, the um, twin pin. Mm -hmm. That thing's killer. And it's really good in um, a lot of conditions. But I do think like there'll be more exploration in the smaller end surf with twin fins. Hmm. You know, I think there's going to be more hybrid fish type things that we, we haven't really... I don't think we've tapped that yet. Yeah. A lot of brands that are still on those things. And, um, and then I think you'll see the mid length thing. I just don't think that's done. I, I'm sorry to everyone who's over it. Cause I've, I've gotten some messages of people saying, stop promoting those things. They're, you know, ruining surfing. And, and I, I don't get defensive about it. I understand it, but I I've had great conversations with folks like, so are you seeing less long boards and wave storms in more of those? And which would you rather? Yeah. I'd rather have seven Oh two and three quarter mid lengths any day. Yeah. Then our local good surfers riding those freaking wave storms. That's, that was been the worst because right. our, our bros that are over the crowds, they're just like, they wave the white flag and they said, I'm just going to ride a wave storm. Yeah. And it's over. Like they they've won because <laughs> those things those things paddle better than a nine foot longboard. Yeah. And then, you know, 10, 15 years ago, instead of wave storms or mid lengths, you had guys on nine six performance longboards that would sit out the back and get all the waves. So yeah, are things better or worse? I, I I'd love to hear more. I'll tell you what, you don't you don't see very many performance longboards in the water you know, dominating lineups the way it was in, you know, the late nineties and, you know, but you do see a few 
wave storms, but there's a ton of guys on mid lengths, which is fine. I'm, I'm you fine think with it's, whatever. It's still a bigger advantage than a shortboard, no doubt. But I wonder, do you think it's closed the gap between the outside guys on the on the high performance longboards and the inside guys on shortboards? Like, is the pack getting closer together? And is that would that be? Yeah, a good thing? I, my gut feeling is. You know, listening to your question and thinking about my local lineup, I would say that it's, you know, it's 90%, 90% of the guys are on either mid lengths or below, you know, there's a couple of straggler guys that are 60, you know, like Papa Joe or whoever, but you know, that's just cause they're, they need their 60, they're 70 or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's my call more twin fins and i think i think the mid link thing's not done so i think there'll be people pushing the boundaries on like can you go a little bit shorter with them and Ooh, it'll be it'll be just like the scps when you saw like the scps come out and then the guys are like on six sixes and you're like just get rid of the paddle and then yeah. people are gonna be like just get off the mid link just get a short board <laughs> that, so maybe the future is going to be back to like six two thrusters when, when, is, when do we just come back to that? Oh, man, that's a good question. That'll happen. <laughs> I think it'll happen, but I don't know. I, I do, too. It's, I think that the design du jour type of concept, like the cyclical nature of surfboard design, it just gets more refined. And a lot of it has to do with the region where you're at. You know, like in Santa Barbara, if you've got long wintertime right points, you're going to, the board that works best there is going to be more refined. And it might be a mid-length or whatever. And you know, you're just not going to see mid lengths at pipeline, you know what I mean? And so the, I think regionally, you're going to see a more refinement of what we all agree. Hey, that's the best board for that spot, you know, sure. Um, sure. it's probably the answer. Right. I do, I do sense that quad fins are going to, because what happened with twin fins is people, went, Oh, I love the speed and blah, blah, blah. But if I could just get that tri fin feel. And so Glenn Winton and these guys went to the quad fin and, and you do get a little bit more positivity out of a quad fin. And so I wouldn't be surprised if in a year from now we're revisiting quads, even on mid lengths are, you know, and that's just, and it's not to say that the twins aren't great because I actually love the twin, but I just cyclically, I could see us starting to go there because we're always searching, you know, and it's always, you know, let's, okay, now that I've got the speed, let's get some positivity. And now that I've got the positivity, maybe I should go to a tri fin and, you know, yeah, who knows? Speaking of searching, have you had any interest to try that? Um free scrubber the tommy twin fin how big is it it could be as big as you, as big as you want it's a short board i mean it's it's based off of tom kern's favorite uh short board uh, twins that al made him in like 1980 yeah i 81. remember watching him surf they, those movies came out those jimmy Mate, mateo mateco those jimmy films medico medico yeah jimmy medico films those videos actually there were videos vhs's came out with Tommy riding them. This was before Trifin, so I want to say whatever, but he, Tommy was ripping on those twin fins. And to answer your question, uh, certainly I'm open to trying them, but um, I've, I've refined my situation down to, I know what my, sh my shortboard needs to look like. And, and I rode a board by Chris Borst in mainland oh, wow. Mexico. Yeah, that Borst made for Taylor Knox. And Taylor's like, here, try this. I think you'll like it. And I grabbed it, wrote it. And like, it was one of those boards where I was like, I don't really want to give this back to you. You know what I mean? Like it fit like a glove. I was like, oh my God. So I have one of those coming and I'm looking forward to getting that under my feet. Um, but I'm certainly open to try that, yeah. that board, you know? Um, it's a v, um, I think what's different is it's, they revisited the V bottom. That was kind of the magic of those things. And oh, okay. So there's a lot of range in it. And um, yeah, Tom. Tom's loving it. Tom just got back. He went to Mexico for the last two weeks with buds. Yeah, yeah. He got some good waves. Yeah, yeah. South, right here. South Swell's already nailing that place down there. Well, More speaking of good waves, let's let me just switch gears here real quick because, as you know, I'm of opinion that regarding competition, the waves are the stars. If you've got great pipeline or great J Bay or great Malibu and you put surfers out there, we're going to watch it. And it doesn't necessarily even need to be the top guy in the world. You could put Jamie O'Brien out at Pipeline and we're engaged. Um, or you could put, 
you know, Clay Marzo out at eight foot G land and I'm engaged. And, um, and you, of course, you, you're in the position where you're uh, on some level, you're the long board commissioner. You are the long board commissioner for the WSL. And they recently put out a release, or I guess you did, that said that you're going to have three events this year. There's going to be one at Manly, one at Huntington Beach, and one at Malibu, which is worth two times the points. And I saw this and I went, oh, that's not really the way that Devin and I talked about this about a year ago, where it was like, we're excited to actually get longboard events at really good longboard ways. I personally don't see Manly Beach as like, when you think of really great longboard ways, Manly Beach is number 35 on my list, you know? And frankly, Huntington Beach is too. And I know they both have legacy. That does more to do with, um, yeah, 1967, that's all we were riding at, at you know, Manly Beach was longboards. That's why they were longboard ways. I mean, um, what are your thoughts on this new longboard tour that you guys put together? Well, thanks for asking that question, Bass. <laughs> that was a nice lead up to saying that it, that it sucks, but um... <laughs> <laughs> just my opinion. I think you could have done better. What about Noosa? Oh, I think the I think that's fair, and um, you know the. I think you give me a little more credit on the job than, than maybe I uh, should or do get or whatever. But I, my main job there is I'm, I'm not this business strategic person. And, and I, um, I, most, I mostly was brought in there to stabilize the tour and transform from high performance longboarding, which is shortboarding your longboard to traditional. So turning you know, turning around a judging panel 180 degrees in a year is, is no small task. So that was pretty challenging. And I've since produced a document that lays out how to do this in great detail. And no, I mean, no one's done that before. And it's really helpful so that if anyone that's a judge that has never judged longboard surfing, if they give themselves a few days to study this document, Longboard surfing will be in a great place. And this is for anyone that even cares about competition. And probably a few, few of the listeners are tuning out right now, like boring. But um, so I just wanted to set sort of like, where, where do I fit into this and what do I own? The league itself owns the business side of things and there's business realities. I know you guys have been talking a lot about the CT and I think it's publicly known that the league is trying to sort of like stabilize and sort of refocus on the, the brass tacks of the business and coming out of a pandemic, getting its ass kicked, losing lots of money um, from not running events, gave them time to rethink about how, how do we ensure that this thing's sustainable and profitable? So that's why you have like the mid-year cutoff and all these really controversial things that are really um, sort of upsetting people. And then on the longboard side of things, they were looking at it in the same way and there was some, some vacillation back and forth on the path to go. And then when things sort of came down to the wire, the, the, the options on the table for 2022 were Manly and US Open. And I will agree with you, they're, they're not ideal. They're not top notch longboard waves. So I think that's a fair critique. And I think there'll be lots of questions from people. The, the reason I think that we can support it and get behind it is that on the business side that those were the best options at that time and the reality on the ground is is a lot of a lot of brands weren't scrambling to put in the money to be at, at, at top-notch breaks so malibu for sure is you know that's that's the pipeline of the tour uh vans stepped up they've got the us open that's been around forever and they were interested in engaging and getting involved in some way with um, the WSL while maintaining the, the Joel Tudor duct tape thing. So for this particular one, they're giving up all of their duct tape stuff and they're just going fully in with the, the format. That wave is a challenge, but because of the legacy of it and the history from the US championships till the US Open, there's a level of acceptability that like it can make sense culturally, it's a huge stage. Um, Manly has the same uh, 
same thing, maybe on a smaller scale. For Australia, it's a big deal. It gets more airtime than just about anything. We won't see it as much in the US, but it'll be on Fox Sports. Um, it's going to get a lot of play. And so the league is looking at it as, as like a really good way to get from where we were coming out of a pandemic, not having a lot of great financial options for 2022, which is why it kind of came together at the last second. What I can tell you is that they're working on the plan right now for 2023. And that's looking at the potential of more stops than that and moving on from those breaks and, and re-engaging on high quality breaks. I, I don't want to say what the breaks are, but they would be what you would call high quality longboard breaks. And I think beach breaks in general probably should just stay off the list of options. They're too short, traditional longboard surfing, if that, you know, and that's what we're, we're doing is traditional longboard surfing. You need room to move. You need that dance floor. It can't just be a four second closeout. That's just not going to work. It's not going to be interesting. So Sounds that, like Manly and Huntington. Yeah. Hey, fair. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. They're, they're not, they're certainly not ideal. And I don't think, I don't think anyone's going to sit here and, and tell you otherwise. But I'm, I'm just sharing with you, I'm being really like forthcoming with, hey, these were to pull them off. And so not this was a stopgap measure is what this was. This was like, and how much of this then, because I think to myself, I'm like, look, if the WSL is the league for creating world champions and we've had a pandemic to get our shit together and we realized, oh, after a year and a half, we're, we don't want to do something that loses more money. Why not just not even do the world longboard tour with the WSL? In my opinion, um, if you can't do it absolutely 100% killer, don't do it at all. Yeah. And let somebody like Vans come in and go, you know what? We get it. And we've proven that we can run it good or whoever it is. Somebody can get up and go, look, we can pick this thing up and we can crown an incredible world longboard champion. And we can do it at the right places. And it'll benefit because to me, this reeks of for sure the surfers weren't even engaged in this. There's no way that, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't see, you know, eight out of 10 world longboard tour guys going, yeah, let's do it at Manly instead of Noosa. And yeah, let's do it at Huntington Beach instead of San Onofre. Yeah, look, man, those are, <laughs> you're, you're digging deep and I, I appreciate it. Like there's, those are good questions. Um, look it, 2023 is like it's more like i think it's accurate to say we're trying to get from where we were to where we're going and i think the breaks and and the talk of the support level for next year and in really getting the focus of the league um is going to be part of the success of it so those are fair questions um you know I, coming out of we had the Mal malibu and surf ranch those were sort of reactionary to like hey where could we pull these events off we still didn't even know if we at that time could we pull off events would california shut us down um it seems like the, now that we know that the options are a lot bigger we, we've got we've got a good runway ahead and the surfers you know they're willing to invest right now they i think everyone agrees it's not the perfect scenario but i think you know let's give it a shot let's see how this works this year and there, you know, the it just seems like Devin that it, it seems like at the end of the day, the WSL doesn't really care. Like it seems like they're going, Oh, that's right, we've got these guys over here. God, we'd hate to lose that. Um, can somebody pull something together? Can some, you know what? We should, you know, like let's, I don't know, call Devin, he seems to know what the fuck's going on. You know, it just, it, it just seems like, and I know you don't have complete control over it, which must be frustrating for you because you and I have spoken at length and you and I both agree. We're both on the same page on this. And so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it just feels like if this is the best the WSL can do, then they don't really care about longboard tour and they can say as much as they want. And we can talk about how great next year is going to be. But I mean, how many years do we need to get it right? Like, at what point do you just go, you know what, they don't give a shit. And it feels like right now they don't give a shit. 
and I'll, I'll just move on from that. Yeah, no, look, I think you're an astute observer and you have good instincts and, um, you know, we should pass that feedback on because I think, I think, I think that'd be helpful to know if that's, if that, if a lot of people are feeling that way, that, that should be motivation to, to not just settle for that. You know, well, look, the, the, re the recipe is so simple. The waves are the stars. And that's on every single level of, of professional competitive surfing. World's, yeah, world's best surfing, world's best waves. You know, like it is a formula. I know we looked at, you know, some of the beach breaks when they were coming out of the pandemic weren't that interesting, right? For the CT, it was kind of like. It was lame. Even. But even I'll, give you a, I'll give you a pass on COVID. Like I get that we were like, hey, we got to move the tour forward in a COVID year in 21. Let, we're going to have to do Newcastle. We're, you know, like everyone gives you guys a pass for that. Sure. I'm saying this is what you came up with after a year and a half to stew on it was Manly and Huntington Beach. And it just feels like, oh, let's just glom those longboarders onto an event we already have running. We'll do let them surf in the off days, which is, by the way, sort of what Joel Tudor was saying on Instagram when he was you know, he was pounding the bell like this is lame. We only have one event. What's going on? Like, so Joel pounded this bell and this seems reactionary towards Joel. Yeah, Joel was, um, you know, he got wind of sort of, you know, there was no plan at the time. It was December and nothing had been brought forth to the surfers and he was worried it's going to go to one event. It's going to go to one event back to what it was. So he started blasting. And as you know, he's, he's, a, he's been suspended. He's no longer with the league, unfortunately. Um, Why was he suspended exactly? Do you, can you give me um, He was suspended for, um, there was a couple things in the rule book. There's, if you want to read the particular- I don't, want, I don't need to read that. I well, mean, whatever. So it, he violated rules. There's a rule Yeah, I mean, uh, what, the, what the league put forth to him was, um you know ver verbal assault um unbecoming of you know like making a professional bad. yeah yes yeah. yeah, unsportsmanlike conduct and yeah. he he was critiquing the league for um some you know you can go people can go back and read all this stuff on their own but he had some critiques about um a quality of um treatment of the surfers joel's yeah. position was that longboarders been treated like second-class citizens and in this age <laughs> of equality so uh, we're going to yeah. give you manly and huntington <laughs> <laughs> nothing reeks of second-class citizens like yeah we're going to do two events at okay go ahead yeah and so so um you know the core values are quality inclusion and all these sorts of things and joel says he made a case that if the brands themselves, if, if you watch the commercials on the WSL, um, Bill, even Billabong during the Pipeline Masters, what were their commercials? They were women longboarding. If you close your eyes and think right now, what are most of the brands putting forth for women's marketing? It's not CT surfers, it's longboarding. So he posed the, I think, really great question that deserves some, some real thought and some, some good answers is, if the support is there from the brand side, when they're if they're using the likeness of longboard women for marketing, why is the World Surf League telling us as surfers that there's no financial support? I'm confused. Right. That was sort of his tact. Yeah. And he went for, with that for a while, and, and a little bit later on in his campaign uh, to sort of put us on the ropes to do something about it. He made a couple personal comments, which, you know, toward people that work at the league. That is what actually got him. It wasn't the critiquing of the league. It was the personal piece of it that I don't yeah. want to get into or name. Yeah, it. I don't either. So it, that's how, what, long, how long is he? How long is when is Joel going to be back? Will he um, will he be available? Will he be allowed to defend his world championship? He will not. He uh, the league has determined that what. Is at this point, exactly Joel Tudor, has his world title been taken away? Is he still called the world champion? Yes. Yeah, there's no stripping of titles. Um, you know, it's like... And how, has, how has Joel responded to this? Do you have any insight on what... I, I don't. I, I've sent him the letter. Um, he's just kind of gone quiet. 
Yeah. He hasn't, it, you know, he hasn't said anything publicly. Um, when you're suspended from the any sports league, you know, usually part of the condition is if you go public and whine and cry about it, you, it'll be, uh, it, it'll be extended. That's that's yeah. pretty typical. And yeah. so, I don't, you know, I don't know what Joel's going to do. I don't talk to him that often. Yeah. You know, he he and I have a, always had a rocky, weird <laughs> French, quote unquote, friendship. So. Yeah. I'll go for months without talking to him, but yeah. I do think it's a shame that he'll be missed. You know, it's too bad that it came to this. And um, I, look, dude, I just came to the do. I just care about the surfing, you know, like yeah. I'm not into the politics. Um, I do have my viewpoints on the business. If, if people want to engage me on that, I do have lots to offer. I, do, I probably am an untapped resource, unfortunately, but um, it's a big league and, and longboard surfing is just part of a much bigger thing. And I think, I think all your critiques are valid. I hear you, dude. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. All right. Well, um, what else? What have we missed here this morning? What, what else could you grill me on? Well, I'm, you know, <laughs> this is kind of low hanging fruit. And I hate to, I hate to just, I mean, I'm just disappointed is what it is. It's okay. Like, yeah. And I feel like, I agree. I feel like somebody, I feel like if you're not going to do it right, don't do it at all. Like if you're yeah. so called the, the, the world surf league and you're the ones that, and it just feels like you're not doing it right. And it's, frankly, it feels like, and I know it's not you, because you've made it clear today that you're not completely, uh, you know, you don't have all the business strategies. You don't get to sign off on all the business strategies, but you have created a great template for the judging. And, um, and now it's incongruent. You know, it's like, okay, let's take traditional longboard judging and put it in three foot closeout beach break. And it's kind of like, what the hell, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like I said, the wedge of the stars, you know, frankly, you know, anyway, I've, I've been spouting this for so long that it, yeah. even I'm sick of hearing myself talk about it. Well, um, did you watch the Rip Curl Bells event? What did you think about that? This just I ended did. a couple of days ago. Um, I think it's a bummer to see it finished at two foot ring con, of course, you know, but um, there was a couple of days of phenomenal surfing, you know, oh, thank God, yeah, bells, like that the day that John John got the 10 and that that kid Zhao Chianka just like watching every last couple events where that kid comes up against John John and they have the best heats of the event yeah. it's a shame that that kid is potentially not going to make the mid-year cutoff when he's one of the best There's such a, this is such a great example Devin for the the concept of let's take 12 surfers and put them in the greatest waves and have an event that runs in one day and that's it fly in fly out purple blob tour 12 surfers and guess who everyone right now everyone wants to see more of jow chianka against yeah. john john you yeah. know but the structure of you know this this sort of old format i've been kind of pimping this concept that look print is dead you and I worked in print organizations when print was dying and everyone there was like, no, it's not It'll surfer magazine. It'll never <laughs> go away. And I was beating the drum, dude, there's this thing called the internet. And it's the same way I feel about competitive surfing formats right now. It's over. Do we really want to spend two weeks? By the way, there was about four or five hours of insane glued to the computer surfing at the bells event, which was mind blowing. And you mentioned it. Yeah. You can do all that. Why am I do? Why am I spending two weeks to get to these great four hours? We don't have to do that. You know, do I really need to see, you know, the 20, you know, the 29th ranked surfer in the world go up against John, John Florence? No, I don't. You know, do we need to see those same surfers lose all year for 10 years straight? No, no. I, I So do you like the mid-year cutoff? Are you, I love are you it. back in it? I'm, I love less surfers on the championship tour and less amount of time waiting for waves. My thing is fly these guys to great waves, put only 12 of them, maybe 16, because it's going to make more sense from a formatting standpoint. You run eight heats overlapping. You finish this thing in one day or a day and a half, and you're in and out and uh, way less overhead, way less T and E way more and it's all pay-per-view by the way and it's going to be engaging i'm going to pay 10 bucks to watch it i'm not i don't want to spend two weeks determining whether 
the commissioner wants to turn it on in shitty waves or not because it's Easter Sunday. And oh, by the way, we got it. You know, it, it's just there's too many archaic concepts. It needs disruption. And unfortunately, there's too much legacy and too many archaic people surrounding the decision makers there that are not yeah. going to let something like this happen. So the disruption is going to come from outside. It's going to come from somebody like Red Bull or somebody that's going to just be like, you know what? I'm flying Clay Marzo and Jao Chianka to eight foot can do it left. Who wants to watch? And I'm raising my hand. You've been crying purple blob tour for years. I just, I don't know. It doesn't seem like they're listening to you. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure it comes up and then somebody goes oh but what about my world title in 1972 or whatever you know what about you know it's like dude nobody you, gives a shit you're friends with dave prodan i'm sure you I am can dave. Pull apart I am with him friends. i love dave Dave's he's a the great strategy guy. guy what does he think of you he's, he's heard me he'll hear this and and i'm sure that dave's like the only salt in the building i don't I, you know it seems to me that dave's the only guy that i can count on to maybe have this this concept heard but i don't know well, I do, I do think the future is less surfing. It seems like, you know, again, I'm not part of the strategy stuff, but just looking at the way it's playing out, it, it, you know, the surfers have been freaking out. They wrote that letter. I know you got, I listened to your podcast. You guys talked about this already, so we don't need to go through it again, but, yeah. you know, pretty emboldened battle. I There's don't... a vote of no confidence for Jesse Miley Dyer. That's the vibe that I'm getting from everything I read from, from Steve Shearer on swell net to, uh, other guys that I'm reading um, and, and just what, you know, and hearing, you know, through the coconut wireless yeah. that they are not pleased with what's happening with the commissioner. And um, that is never a good thing. That is never a good thing. And yeah, you know, we'll see how it plays out. I think there, most of them are going to go to Western Oz, even though there was a threat to boycott. Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it plays out. But I mean, how, what are the, how much of that's just a bluff, you know, like, I mean, it is a quite a, it's quite a message, but where are they going to go? What are they going to do? It's a hundred percent a bluff. I mean, the reality is if you want to be a pro surfer, if the world surf league was to go away today, where do those people go? Who's going to do it? Maybe Red Bull, like you said, but it's, well, it, it's, it's going to take a disruptor like that. It's going to be a total change in everything. It's, you know, it's going to have to be. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have a world champion. We can determine a world champion in six or eight targeted purple blob events, you know. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't continue the legacy of crowning a world champion. Yeah. And it's my hope that the WSL does it. <clears throat> but yeah. frankly, the WSL could disappear tomorrow. We could see a press release tomorrow that just says Dirk Ziff decided he's moving on. And it wouldn't surprise me. He's he's had enough of the beach grid articles. He's over it. <laughs> well, I sense that this is just a great write-off for him. I mean, he's got so many incredible businesses. What a great way to just go, you know what? Let's let's use that one for a tax write-off. And so why not just keep it going? Yeah, I I mean, I don't really know those guys. I've met them once or twice, but I find it hard to believe that any rich person would enjoy losing money. That just doesn't seem like a trait of theirs. Yeah, yeah I don't know so. either. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so business savvy that I understand how it all works either. I'm just a, just another idiot in a chair in his office trying to yeah. talk I mean, and figure the, it out. A couple of times I've talked to them, the sense I got is that he and his wife are really passionate about surfing. And they they believe that by them supporting this, that they can stabilize it and make it a real like viable sustainable thing i mean and that's yeah. not necessarily i'm not trying to come in and defend them because i work there but i've just yeah i heard that theory a lot of the tax write-off yeah and i don't know i i'm not going to generalize rich people but generally they're pretty tight with money and <laughs> i'm not going to generalize but here i go <laughs> <laughs> like you know it's like yeah, we'll see. Look, I want the WSL to succeed. I've always said that. I'm, I think Elo's a great guy and all the people over there are doing their best. And there's a lot of, um, you know, forces that are pulling people different ways. And at the end of the day, you know, if I get into an elevator with you and you tell me that you're about putting the best surfers in the best waves and creating a world champion, then prove it. Yeah. And well, they did. I mean, I was engaged in the Rip Curl Bells event. 
for about four hours. And I was super engaged in the pipe and the sunset events. Like they've, they've got me, but there's so much obvious trimming of the fat that needs yeah. to occur. Well, they had two, two, two full days of good waves. And what does it take about four full days, really big full days to run the CT? So if they got rid of half the surfing, there you go. They, they, yeah, they and look, like I mean, Augusta. frankly, you know, is Bell's really on the Purple Blob Tour? Like, maybe it is, but I mean, that was perfect Bell's. Like, that's as good as it gets. And everyone, and luckily the surfing was so great that we're willing to go, okay, three turns in the bowl, here we go. And then a bunch of cutbacks. I think small bells would be great on the longboard tour. I agree. I, it's a super good longboard ride. Perfect what, you know, or the mid-length tour that when John, <laughs> when, when John Wayne Freeman starts that, I, there's like people always saying that. I'm like, <laughs> the world doesn't need that. Like, do we really need to watch an event of people going straight? absolutely not we, we don't need that I mean, we could call it the hand jive tour it's just like it's all about where the hands are kind of jiving that oh makes, my gosh he gets a 10 <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh. gosh I all right look we've said a lot yeah people falling asleep yet are we no we're keeping them going look i'm excited to have channel islands at the boardroom international surfboard show yeah. that's coming up in october the we're 8th there. and 9th at the del mar fairgrounds and uh, we've got a great uh, event planned here coming up in about six months. Devin, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always great catching up with you. And thank uh, you. And I have to love to you and your family. Yeah. And I hope we get to surf together again one day. I miss, I miss surfing with you and trading waves and getting, <laughs> getting inspired by your bottom turn. Oh, boy. that's, that's kind of you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, the feeling's mutual. I'm inspired by Devin Howard 2.0 it's good <laughs> all right well let's let's go ride some twin fins soon i want to do that too we, we, we'll have to talk off air about that okay. all right buddy thank you thanks Beth.